All right. So my, my last book was about uh, an Irish-American boxer named John L. Sullivan, uh, who grew up in the South End and became the first American sports superstar. So after I had done that book, uh, I told my agent about this idea that I had for my next book. So I said, how about this? It's a story of a band of refugees from the famine in Ireland who come to America. They fight on both sides of the Civil War. Then they unite in an army, which they call the Irish Republican Army. And then they, they uh, undertake one of the most fantastical missions in military history, which is to kidnap the British province of Canada and hold it hostage and ransom it for Ireland's independence. So her first question to me after that was, when did you start deciding to write fiction? <laughs> <laughs> and then the second question was, how many pints of Guinness uh, inspired this, this idea? So I, I know that the idea sounds like complete blarney, but it actually happened, and the Irish attacked Canada not just once, but five times between 1866 and 1871. So it sounds absurd today, but part of what my job is going to be is to try to transport you back about 160 years to see that this idea is not as crazy as it sounds. So why would anyone want to attack sweet, lovable, polite <laughs> Canada, where even after you get into a traffic accident, the bus will say, sorry. <laughs> so part of that is us viewing history through the lens of today, where the United States and Canada share the longest, peaceable international boundary in the world. But things between the United States and Canada were not always so polite. And in the first American century, the United States had a border problem. It was a northern one. And the border was this lawless no man's land that was rife with counterfeiters and smugglers. And there was a lot of tension between the United States and Canada in terms of where the boundary actually was. And it was about as American as fireworks on the 4th of July in the first American century to attack Canada. So even before John Hancock puts his John Hancock on the Declaration of Independence, when the Continental Army forms, it goes due north. And Richard Montgomery seizes Montreal. Benedict Arnold leads a troop up through Maine. Uh, and there's a battle in Quebec City on the last day of 1775 that turns out to be a disaster for the Continental Army. During the War of 1812, there's constant action going back and forth across the border. So even before the British torched the White House, uh, the Americans went to Toronto, burned down Toronto. The Canadian forces came across the Niagara River, burned down the village of Buffalo. And then you start to get these series of farcical encounters with equally farcical names. So there was the Pork and Beans War of 1838 <laughs> up in Maine, where a group of lumberjacks on the Maine and New Brunswick side were competing over the same logging rights. And then my favorite was the Pig War of 1859, uh, which I can assure you was complete baloney. <laughs> so this happened when an American on a disputed island in Washington, the San Juan, uh, off the coast of Washington, the San Juan Islands, uh, sees a pig rooting around in his potato garden and shoots it dead. Turns out the pig is owned by the Hudson Bay Company, uh, which is Canadian, and this dispute over the island and then the shooting of the pig rolls out of control to the point that 2,000 British troops and 500 American troops are stationed on the island. And I think someone, told, it was General George Pickett who was in charge of the American troops who were on the island there. So, so you have this constant tension between the United States and Canada at the time. And the other thing to remember is that the flag that's flying over Canada at this time is not the maple leaf that we know it today. It's this flag, the Union Jack. And for many Irish, this is a hated emblem, particularly among the Irish who invade Canada, which, using today's parlance, we'd probably say that they were radicalized by their experiences living under British rule. So for 700 years, the luck of the Irish was not something to be coveted. They had the misfortune of being right in the backyard of Great Britain and what would then become the most powerful empire in the world up to, up to that point. And after England uh, comes in as a colonizer of Ireland, they enact a lot of discriminatory policies against Irish, and particularly the Irish Catholics. So in the 1700s, under the penal laws, 
Irish Catholics cannot worship, they cannot vote, they cannot hold public office, they cannot own firearms, they cannot own a horse that was over five pounds in worth. They were allowed a knife if it was chained to a table so it couldn't be used against any law enforcement. And even in death, that was restricted too because priests were not allowed to preside over cemetery um, graveside services. So for 700 years, the Irish think that the British are attempting to exterminate their culture, their religion, their language, and then when the potato crop fa uh, fails in the 1840s, there's a lot of Irish who think that the British are altogether just trying to exterminate them as well in what they would think is a genocide. So during the, what they would call the Great Hunger uh, is what a lot of Irish will refer to it as, not the famine. Famine, the use of that word implies that there was not enough food to go around. Many Irish think that there was, and it was exports of wheat and barley and oats under armed guard out of Ireland at the time when Ireland needed all the food that it could. So one million people died during the Great Hunger, another two million flee, about one million of them flee to North America. And then when the Irish get to the United States, they, sort, they, they find that they are uh, encountering the discrimination of a lot of nativists. And the Irish who come to America as a result of the Great Hunger are unlike any newcomers to the country before. For one thing, they're refugees from a humanitarian disaster. They're not immigrants. So they're not hungering for the ideals of America. <coughs> they're literally just starving for food. They speak a foreign tongue. A quarter of them speak Irish. Many of them are illiterate. They practice a foreign religion <coughs> to many Americans, which is Catholicism. <coughs> And that causes real tension because you have the European founding of America based on those who are trying to escape papism and come to America for that reason. So you have this backlash that starts to happen in the 1850s and the rise of the know-nothings. And they really gain their greatest stronghold here in Massachusetts where they win in the 1854 elections all statewide offices, all but three of the 380 seats in the Massachusetts legislature. <laughs> And then they go ahead and put in place their program, which included mandating the use of the Protestant King James Bible in schools. They broke up Irish American militias. They launched surprise inspections of, of uh, convents and rectories. And in Massachusetts and New York, there were deportations of Irish back to the British Isles. And I'll be talking about this a little bit more later in the afternoon session I'm doing about how America despised the Irish when they first came along. So the Irish do not assimilate very easily into America. And for years, the English had always talked about the Irish problem. And of course, to the English, the Irish problem is that they weren't English. So they were trying to attempt to anglicize the Irish and take away their culture and their language and their religion. But the Irish were able to maintain that by not assimilating with the English. That's how they were able to survive. So when they come to America, why should they behave any differently? So the more they threaten, they feel threatened, the more they coil inward for protection, sort of like, like a snake. And many of them, even after living in the country for 10, 20 years, still view themselves as Irish first and American second. And they cling together in parishes, fraternal organizations like the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and a new organization that was founded in 1858 called the Fenian Brotherhood. And the Fenian Brotherhood is the uh, product of these two men here. On the left is James Stevens, and James Stevens, uh, and on the right, John O'Mahony, they were both veterans of the Young Ireland Movement in 1848 that attempted an unsuccessful revolution against the British. Uh, failed in large part because they're trying to do this right in the heart of the great hunger and people are just trying to survive. And James Stevens actually is wounded in a shootout with the local constables who leave him for dead on the side of the road during, uh, in, in 1848. And he sort of um, foreshadows Mark Twain by staging his own death. So they run an obituary in his local newspaper, the Kilkenny Moderator, uh, and his father carries a coffin uh, laden with stones into the local cemetery and buries it in the ground. So the British think that James Stevens is dead, but he's actually on the run, 
gets out of Ireland, manages to cross through England, spends even a night in a hotel across the street from Buckingham Palace, right under the nose of Queen Victoria, and flees to Paris. And John Omani joins him there as well. And Omani eventually, after living in Paris for five years, moves to the second most Irish city in the world, and that's New York City, the most Irish city behind Dublin. And the two think by 1858 that Ireland is now ready to try another revolution. So they put together a unique transatlantic partnership. In Ireland, on St. Patrick's Day in 1858, James Stevens forms what's called the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Later that year, at Tammany Hall in New York City, John O'Mahony puts together an organization called the Fenian Brotherhood. And the basic idea is that the Fenian Brotherhood in America, where they're not under the nose of the British and have civil rights, will raise money, purchase weapons, ship them to Ireland, where James Stevens will put together the army that's going to launch the next uprising. So this is a familiar story that you'll even see into the 1980s here in Boston with, uh, with the troubles in Northern Ireland. Now, the members joined the society had to take an oath. And it was intended to be a secret society. And because they had to take a secret oath, these uh, members run afoul of the Catholic Church. So eventually, the pope will uh, dictate that uh, any members of the Fenian Brotherhood would be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Now, the great irony of this is that this secret society was anything uh, was good at everything but keeping a secret. <laughs> so they were easily infiltrated by spies, and they used their gift of gab very liberally because every movement that they made was broadcast in the newspapers. So really, Britain did not have to go through all the trouble of infiltrating the organization. Really, if they just had a newspaper subscription, they would know the move of uh, every move of the Fenian Brotherhood. So this plan's in place, and then all of a sudden the Civil War breaks out in, in 1861, and you have Irish who start enlisting in very large numbers uh, and fighting on both sides of the Civil War. So there's a scholar uh, in Ireland named Damien Shields who's estimated that about 200,000 Irish-born men take up arms uh, in the Civil War, about 20,000 of them on the side of the Confederacy. And they're not driven by the Union soldiers are not driven by uh, abolition. It's really, and in the South, about defending slavery rights. It's, it, a lot of it is due to just the geographic place where they happen to have, have settled. But you do have men who will <coughs> decide to enlist to sort of prove their patriotism to the know nothing. Some are enlisting because they don't expect it to be a long war, and it's a paying job. And they're still, the Irish are still at the bottom of the economic ladder. But you then have some members of the Fenian Brotherhood who think that the Civil War could be a good training ground for the fight that they really want to wage, which is going to be the revolution back in Britain. So they can take this, again, what they think is going to be this short war to just learn tactics, learn about weaponry, and then they'll be able to export this knowledge for, for the purpose that they really want to, to use them. Of course, the war drags on and drags on a lot longer than anyone thought, and the Irish are the ones who end up bearing a lot of the heavy losses very early on in the war. But as the war progresses, uh, the Union camps become recruiting grounds for the Fenian Brotherhood, who send recruiters out to visit uh, these organizations. Uh, there would be donation boxes, and they would sign up men for the organization. And when the Fenian Brotherhood decides to hold its first national convention in 1863, Union soldiers who are members of the Fenian Brotherhood were actually permitted to leave the battlefields, to leave the front lines, and travel to Chicago, which sort of shows you their, their, their growing influence here. So that by the end of the Civil War, the Fenian Brotherhood has about 300,000 members. And again, this is the secret society. But they have a whole Irish state in exile that they've uh, established. So they have their own president. They have their own constitution. And they have their own very they have their very own capital right in the heart of New York City, which is this brownstone called the Moffat Mansion, and the newspapers would f refer to it as the Fenian White House. The, and the Fenians even issued their own bonds, so these were printed in denominations from ten dollars to five hundred dollars, and you would pay your money here for the war effort, just like a war bond. And they would be payable six months after Ireland actually gained its independence. That's the intention. 
The, the interesting footnote to this is when Ireland gains its independence 60 years later by no connection to the Fenian Brotherhood, there are people who still have these bonds hanging around in their uh, drawers and tried to get them redeemed by the Irish Republic who had no idea where, where these were coming from. <laughs> so in the fall of 1865, after the end of the Civil War, the Fenian Brotherhood, Irish Republican Brotherhood, they're ready to implement their plan of revolution in Ireland. So you have Civil War vets who start going secretly into Ireland, and the British have, again, infiltrated the organization. They see what's coming, and they suspend habeas corpus. They round up all the Fenian leaders. James Stevens is forced to be on the run again. And really, the dream of the uprising in Ireland is dead for at least the time being. This turns out to be fortuitous for rising sentiment inside the Fenian Brotherhood that uh, th there's a group that calls itself the Men of Action and has been tired of waiting to do this uprising in Ireland and thinks it's completely ridiculous to try to plan the movement of weapons across the ocean when the Fenians don't even have a single boat. So why are we trying to have this invasion in Ireland when we can just walk to the nearest point of the British Empire, which is right over the northern border to Canada. So now that the dream is dead of this revolution in Ireland, the, this group, the Men of Action, really come to the ascendancy inside the Fenian Brotherhood. So, so why Canada? What's the theory here? Well, one is that it's going to divert the British from Canada. Maybe they'll send their troops from, or they'll divert them from Ireland. They'll send their troops from Ireland to Canada make it easier for the, the, the skeleton organization that's still left in Ireland to have an uprising. Another idea is that, well, Canada, they gain a piece of land, they'll gain belligerent rights, they'll be able to put privateers out on the ocean and disrupt British uh, traffic. Uh, some think that what they might do is going to spark a war between the United States and Great Britain, and as a result, the United States might liberate Ireland for their assistance in this war. To some Fenians, however, it was just as simple. They're going to take Canada, seize it, and then they will literally just trade it with the British for Ireland. You get Canada back if we get Ireland. And what I found really the most interesting in doing the research for this book is that this plan would be completely afoul of American neutrality laws, not allowed to make war against a country that the United States is not at war with. However, this really is a plan that has at least the tacit support, uh, the tacit support of the United States government, at least they're going to turn a blind eye to this. So in a meeting in the fall of 1865 at the White House with President Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State Seward, the Fenians report that in their meeting with Johnson, he said that he would, quote, acknowledge accomplished facts, which they took to mean that I'm not going to look. You guys go over the border. You get Canada. Then what am I going to do about it? Sounds like typical Andrew Johnson style of leadership, <laughs> right? So why, why with neutrality laws is President Johnson willing to, willing to take this position? Well, it really has to do a lot with the animosity towards the British as a result of what happens during the Civil War. So Anglo-American relations at the end of the Civil War are probably at their lowest ebb since the British burned down the White House. And it has to do with the British Britain's, um, neutrality, which was uh, during the war, which allowed the Confederacy to have certain belligerent rights, but it really had to do with the construction of Confederate warships such as the CSS Alabama in British ports. And there's reports of even British sailors serving aboard these Confederate warships and faking Southern accents to, to fit in. And at the end of the war, the United States wants millions of dollars in reparations for all the damage to shipping that was caused by the, these Confederate um, Confederate warships. And then there's also a lot of animosity towards Canada itself be, because of what happened during the Civil War. So it's a safe haven for escaped POWs, but then it's also uh, where a cell of the Confederate Secret Service has set up safe haven. And from there, it plots the raid on St. Albans, Vermont in 1864, raid on another town in, in Maine. Uh, they plot a firebombing of public theaters and, and buildings in New York City that they try to carry out, but luckily does not come to fruition. And there's thoughts that this uh, <coughs> Secret Service in Canada was also plotting the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So uh, 
the other thing that's in, in play here is that at the end of the Civil War, the United States has gone, has reclaimed the South. It's now spread from ocean to ocean. So the next piece of territory that's there for the taking is to go due north into Canada. So there's actually a bill that's introduced into Congress in 1866 that delineates the four states that are going to be coming into the Union from Canada, and it apportions where the, the next 29 congressmen are going to be coming from as well. So there's also this plan at, in the final days of the Civil War, a senator by the name of Zach Chandler from Michigan has put together a plan to have an army of 200,000 to, uh, to heal the country. It will be 100,000 from the north and 100,000 from the south, and they'll bring the country back together by uniting against a common enemy, being Great Britain, and they'll seize Canada and uh, in and they'll give it back in return for Britain paying the reparations under the Alabama claims, holding Canada hostage and ransoming it for money in this case. So when the Fenian Brotherhood comes along and you know the United States is not necessarily ready to launch another war after going through the Civil War, it's enticing because here's a way to outsource the job. Let's let the Irish go up and be a menace uh, to, to Canada and we don't have to do that. So let's talk about the plan itself to attack Canada. And it's a brainchild of this man, Thomas William Sweeney, who uh, is really the epitome of the fighting Irish. When he came to America as an 11-year-old boy, a storm swept him off the deck of his ship to America, and he spent a half hour in the Atlantic Ocean and somehow managed to survive. When he comes to America, he fights in the Mexican-American War. He has a, a musket ball pierce his right arm, which, allow, which forces it to be amputated. And then uh, he just keeps on going, folds over his sleeve, still serves in the army, uh, gets into a fight with his uh, superior commander, and whips him with his one good arm in a fist fight. He fights in the Civil War. At the Battle of Shiloh, he has two more gunshots to his remaining arm, one more in his leg. And then after the, the war, he serves as the Secretary of War in the Fenian Brotherhood because it's just this, like having this government in exile, so he's part of the Fenian cabinet. So he comes up with this five-pronged plan of attack against Canada. So it's composed of an amphibious landing and uh, also going over land as well. So from the west, there's going to be launching boats from Chicago up through the Great Lakes to land in Ontario. There'll be another landing from Detroit across the Detroit River into Windsor. One more uh, amphibious landing from Cleveland north into Ontario, and another one across the Niagara River from Buffalo. They'll all combine there, march towards Toronto, but they're all feints for the real attack, which is going to be a 17,000-man army right up the Lake Champlain Valley, to seize Montreal, and then Quebec City, and have a chokehold on the lifeline of Canada, which is the St. Lawrence River. So this is a plan that sounds good to this man, John O'Neill. And John O'Neill is a, he was born in Ireland, saw the horrors of the great hunger on the family farm and what it did to his town, which uh, wiped out 20% of its population. And John O'Neill comes to America in 1848, he has learned from his grandfather stories of great rebels in his family, like Hugh O'Neill and Owen Rowe O'Neill, who dared to stand up against the British. And even though they weren't successful in freeing Ireland, they were still heroes because they dared to fight. So John O'Neill uh, has always supported this idea of, of invading Canada because it was at, its, at the nearest point to America. So he gets the telegram uh, in May of 1866 to head to the battlefield with his regiment from Nashville, Tennessee. He leaves behind his wife, his two-month-old son, his business that's worth $50,000, and goes to uh, attack Canada. Now, he gets to Cleveland and then sees that the plan is starting to fall apart even before it's begun. The boats cannot be found in, in Chicago. The commanders cannot be found in Cleveland. Sweeney starts to panic, basically sends all his men to Buffalo. And when they get to Buffalo, the commander still can't be found, so he, he basically puts the highest ranking person he can find in charge, and that's John O'Neill, who now is going to fulfill his lifelong dream, because this is what he wrote, that the governing passion of my life, apart from my duty to my God, is to be at the head of an Irish army battling against England for Ireland's rights. For this I live, and for this I am willing to die. 
So on the night of May 31st, 1866, the Irish come out of the boarding houses of the Irish enclave on the south side of Buffalo. And there's about 800 of them who are going to make this march to the Niagara River and cross into Canada. And as I told you, front page news everywhere for the secret organization about the <laughs> coming Canadian War. So in spite of this, the Canadians do not have defense forces, though, on the other side of the Niagara River, because there have been these reports every few months that the Irish are on their way, and no one, everyone just thought it was like the boy crying wolf. It's not going to happen. So, so there's no defense forces there. The only thing that could possibly stop them is the USS Michigan patrolling out on the, the Niagara River. So when the report comes that the Fenians are marching through Buffalo, the the captain of the ship, Andrew Bryson, orders the USS Michigan out into the Niagara River. The unbeknownst to Bryson, though, the Fenians have a sleeper cell aboard the USS Michigan, and they have a plan to sabotage it so it won't sail. So the 17 uh, men of the Fenian uh, Brotherhood who are on board put together a plan that they're going to take the only man who can pilot this ship, Patrick Murphy, who is no Fenian in spite of his name, and they take him out for a night on the town through the saloons of Buffalo. <laughs> so when the Irish start marching through the streets of Buffalo and Bryson's looking for his pilot, his pilot is, is wandering down Main Street singing the wearing of the green. <laughs> so the Fenians have no trouble getting across the Niagara River and they pierce the British soil with their Irish flags, they raise it over Fort Erie, which was hallowed ground from the War of 1812. And then uh, they're, on, they're in Canada for 36 hours before they even encounter any defense forces. So there are British regular troops who then start to get mobilized once the Fenians cross over. But much of the Canadian defense force is composed of farm boys who have never fired a gun in their life and students from the University of Toronto who the night before the Fenians attack get a knock on their door saying, good news, you don't have to study for those finals anymore tomorrow. <laughs> Bad news, grab a gun and we'll see you at 5 a.m. at the drill shed in Toronto. You're shipping out to the war front to, to repel the Fenians. So on the morning of June 2nd, they meet up here. The blue lines are the movements of the Fenians and the red lines, those of the British and Canadian forces. And they meet uh, about 20 miles south of Niagara Falls at a place called, at a village called Ridgeway. And John O'Neill has seized the higher ground on a limestone ridge. And he can see that coming towards him is a force that's larger than, than the one that he has. And so the battle begins, and the British and Canadians start pressing the fight and moving back the Fenians. And here's one representation of the Battle of Ridgeway. So I guess much like the uh, t-shirts that, that we received today, this is about as historical as, as that illustration is. This is not what the Battle of Ridgeway looked like at all. For one thing, let's talk about what they're wearing. <laughs> yeah. There was the, the uniforms of the Fenians were not all green uniforms. This did not happen until about four years later. They were, some of them were literally wearing their Union blues, their Confederate grays, because you have some um, members of the Louisiana Tigers who came from as far as New Orleans. A lot of them are just wearing civilian dress. On the British side, you did have some red coats, but here I'll show you what the Canadian Defense Forces were wearing. This is, a, this is an accurate watercolor from someone who was there. They're wearing green uniforms. So you can see it's a bit of a confusing fight out here on the battlefield. So O'Neill sees that this larger army is pressing towards him, and then he attempts a maneuver that he knows he can only do with an experienced force. He moves everyone back, uh, and then when he gives the signal, he peers on top of a horse, yells charge, and his men press the uh, advance against the suddenly surprised Canadians. The inexperienced Canadian commander sees John O'Neill on a horse and thinks it's a cavalry attack. It's John O'Neill on a horse. <laughs> so he, he takes a textbook uh, maneuver, puts all his men in a square, which works OK against a cavalry. It doesn't work when there's not a cavalry. And they're basically sitting ducks here and just getting picked off one by one. <laughs> Canadians, these inexperienced boys, throw down their guns and just start running for their lives. And John O'Neill has scored the first victory by an Irish army over a uh, force from the British Empire since 1745. And it's one with deadly consequences. There are about 20 men uh, who die in, in the battle. 
John O'Neill then is wondering, where's all my reinforcements that are supposed to be coming from Buffalo? Where are the Irish who live in Canada that they expected to rise up and, and help them? Well, their supply lines have been cut off. So the Americans have stopped this enterprise. There's no more reinforcements that are coming. John O'Neill circles back to Fort Erie where he had landed and there's another gun battle there, house to house combat. And again, the Fenians are victorious. But John O'Neill sees that after 48 hours, he needs to retreat back to America. So he, before leaving Canada, he lines up all uh, the prisoners, and his prisoners think that they're about ready to face the firing squad. John O'Neill, though, goes down the line, shakes hands with them one by one, and does his best foreshadowing of General MacArthur, telling them that he's going to return to Canada, and he's going to do it with a bigger force. And he's a man that's true to his word. So John O'Neill will return to Canada in 1870, attack them in 1870, attack them in 1871, uh, sometimes with very comical results. And I'll let you read about those uh, in the book. But this is this little known coda to the, the Civil War. And it's one that, uh, spoiler alert, it does not work. <laughs> so, so what's the legacy? So the legacy here is that the Fenian raids bring self-government to a unit that was governed by the British, just not the one that they intended. The Fenian raids are a big push for Canada gaining its own self-government and becoming the Confederation of Canada that goes into effect in 1867, because Canadians don't trust that the British are able to protect them well enough from these crazy invaders coming from the southern border. Then there's also the legacy for Ireland, though, that they established this transatlantic framework where you have America as the money box and Ireland as the place to do the fighting that eventually leads to Ireland's independence in the 1920s after the Easter Rising in 1916. So that Irish Republican Brotherhood that James Stevens forms is uh, the, the leaders of the Easter Rising are, are members of that organization. And in the Irish proclamation that's read outside the general post office, it gives a nod to Ireland's exiled children in America and the role that they played in, in Irish independence. And then you even see this in more modern times with, with Northern Ireland. So, so they have that legacy as well. And then I think it's just, it, it reminds us that a lot of times there are people who fight against incredible odds. And you know what? Most of the stories we hear about people overcoming those incredible odds, but sometimes you just don't. And that's fine, because it's still worth making the fight and fighting and fighting and fighting, because even if you don't achieve success in what you're trying to do, maybe someone from a future generation might do so. And that's what happened with the Fenians. They took the torch from the, the Young Ireland Uprising in 1848. They weren't successful, but they kept the effort alive, and they were eventually able to pass it along to those um, that, that staged the Easter Rising in 1916. So. Um, so with that, uh, just if you want more information about the book, like I said, I have my table downstairs. You can visit my website, ChristopherKlein.com. I do a monthly newsletter with a lot of great history stories that I write about. You can sign up at my table downstairs or, or on the website as well. But with that, does anyone have any questions? No one? Yes. You mentioned, of course, they were smuggling guns and stuff even into the 1980s and stuff, and thank you. Uh, the, uh, a, a Colombo episode dealt with that. <laughs> I'm not familiar with oh, okay. uh, that one, now. I don't remember any detail. It just came up when you were presenting things. And, hmm, yeah. Well, I think there's suspicion right, too, right, that, that Whitey Bulger was sort of involved in this gun running business to, to Northern Ireland, I think, during the 80s as well. Um, and this is what happened in the 1916 Rising, too. There was a um, there was a woman on Beacon Hill, a very wealthy socialite, who married an Irish revolutionary, and their yacht, the Asgard, was to be used to, to um, funnel troops to the uprising in Ireland in 1916. Yes? This is 